this morning. Uh, we thought that that might be a, a good addition to uh, raise up the spirits before we sort of use more of our cerebral activity uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, I really want to uh, thank uh, the Rao for actually organizing uh, this great uh, musical treat uh, we just heard. So thank you very much Rao, for that. Uh, we don't really have a formal opening because um, uh, you know, that could go on. So we decided that, you know, we, what should begin with a powerful keynote and I think that's what we are here to actually listen to. So I won't take too much of, of your time, I just want to say a few words, a few thank yous uh, to begin with. Uh, just want to sort of, uh, you know, tell you a bit about the Think Fest. Uh, the Think Fest, as a lot of you know, is kind of a more academic side of the literary festivals. Um, it aims to sort of create interface between academia and the public. There is not much interaction between the academia and the public, and that is what we really want to achieve here. Uh, so that you would see most of our speakers, uh, over 50, 60, 70% actually, are academics. We also want this to be a place where people of different viewpoints can interact without quarreling. So you will see people from the government, from the opposition, but not screaming at each other, which is a big change from the TV programs that you'll actually see. Uh, then being cordial, then being thoughtful and uh, creative also. And the, the third thing that you really want to um, push through this Think Fest uh, is newer ideas. Of course, our title is taken from um, Sir Muhammad Iqbal's uh, the, the, the word. And your thoughts really need to be germinated at such events, your ideas, uh, your um, actions, and therefore we want this place to be a germination of that for people to come and interact. And that is why we don't have a space where speakers can kind of not meet with the people. So everyone is allowed to meet everyone, we should all inter interact and speak to each other because uh, continuing the conversation I think is the most important thing in Pakistan and, and the need of the hour. So we have got a great galaxy of speakers that we have called from all across the world. So first I just want to thank all our international speakers and also our national speakers who have also come from all across Pakistan. A big thank you for coming to Pakistan. I know lots of um, people don't want to come to Pakistan in the day and age. So thank you very much that you are taking the time to come here. I also want uh, this uh, time to just thank uh, a number of our sponsors because of course without that we would not have called on these speakers. Uh, that does cost us a lot of money and it is through the generosity of all these sponsors that we have uh, been able to bring all of them here. Um, for the last couple of years I've always sort of begun with, uh, with sort of one big support I had to begin with. The big support is of course from the university I am at. ITU, and when I joined that a few years ago, Dr. Omar Seth was there, and he, of course, even though it was a technical university, allowed for this uh, kind of an academic activity in the social sciences to take place. So, um, you know, I, even though he's no longer the vice chancellor of the university, I still would like to thank him for his support uh, for that. And I also want to recognize Dr. Dr. Niaz, who is our acting vice chancellor. He's also he's, his actual job is, of course, the vice chancellorship of the oldest university in the country, uh, the Punjab University. Um, and I really want to thank him that even last last year, when I think he had just become the acting vice chancellor, he did not bat an eyelid and supported us without even asking me heck yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much, Niasa, for your two years of dedicated support. Uh, you don't you. Make us feel that we actually have our own vice chancellor. Maybe your vice chancellorship of Punjab University is the other job. <laughs> so thank you very, very much for that. I think that's kind of became the backbone. Uh, you can see our sponsors list here that you want to recognize. I won't take too much time, but I think I need to sort of mention a few. Uh, the one person I really, really would like to mention is kind of the life of the thing says now is Asma Chishti. Uh, if it weren't for her, uh, Think Fest would not have actually taken off. It would have remained kind of a very small academic endeavor. The fact that hundreds of people do turn up for this is through Asma's um, energy and rigor. And please do go to the excellent, excellent exhibition she has set up in the exhibition hall here on travel uh, throughout Pakistan, showcasing the wonderful and amazing uh, travel opportunities that Pakistan has. I also want to thank Sharyat Shishti, the chairman of Demo Pakistan, for bringing people from all across Pakistan here. Uh, Demo always uh, generously help, helps us uh, to bring 
students from across Pakistan. So we have students from Peshawar, from Karachi, from um, from Bowman University even here. So lots of different universities have actually sent um, students here uh, to participate in this event. And I think, again, as a nation building and as a connecting uh, factor, I think that is very important. I also want to thank, after them, the European oh, Union. Uh, they were one of our main in international partners um, and helped us at a very critical time. So thank you very much for that, the, the delegation of the European Union. Yeah. And we do have a representation here. Uh, the head of the political office um, of the European <laughs> Union is here, uh, delegation. I also want to especially thank uh, Khalid Sahab from uh, Gets Pharma. Uh, he kind of held a hand when um, things were really bad in the economy in Pakistan and gave us the courage that, you know, this will happen. So, thank you very yeah, much, uh, Khalid Mehmood Saab and, and Sibden, who actually sort of uh, spearheaded the move from Gets Pharma. I want to really thank Tura uh, from Diamond Foam. Of course, Diamond Foam has been our sponsor, but Tura personally also uh, helped us in a number of ways. So, thank you, Diamond Foam and uh, Tura. I also want to thank uh, the Engro Corporation uh, for their sponsorship. We kind of arm twisted them into helping us. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Matrix, and of course we always have a very good working partnership with, um, uh, with the French Embassy and they always send a French um, scholar here. So, so thank you very much for that to the, to the French Embassy. I also want to... Uh, I just don't want to miss anyone. Uh, Coca-Cola who actually came in sort of towards the end of it, but it's very good that we're getting some corporate people, some top corporate people think more in terms of history and politics. So thank you Coca-Cola for that. We also want to thank the United States Education Foundation of Pakistan. Uh, they have always been very helpful and Dita Akhtar has been amazing in all our help that he gives us. Uh, Maple Leaf Cement and Lee Segal for his help. Uh, who actually, you know, agrees on it on just a text message. So I think that's a very, very positive sign. And in the end, I, I in the end, I want to thank my uh, my organizing committee, uh, which is led by Chairman Najib Sethi. He's actually at the CCPO office for some uh, important discussion, so he's not here at the moment. But he'll join us in a little minute, uh, a little while. Oh, he is there. Oh, there we are. NS, yes, they've just made it. So NS is the chair of the of, of, of the committee with people like Sibel Hussain, who's the MD of uh, Sayyid Engineers, uh, Dr. Musadek Malik, Mifta Ismail, uh, Asman Shishti is on it, um, Salman Akram Raja, Faisal Nabi, and uh, several others. So I really want to thank the whole committee actually for their combined efforts because they have actually sort of come in uh, and supported this uh, monetarily but also in terms of actual resource support. And I especially want to just recognize Pisaad Asanuddin, the CEO of Cinefax. Uh, he is sort of uh, sensible and critical help as I think very important in taking events like these uh, to the next step. Lastly, I just want to thank my whole team. I will not name them because I'll probably miss people there. But you know who you are and how grateful I am for helping me even while I was away. I've just come back about two weeks ago uh, and you've still been able to pull something off uh, without a staff. Uh, so thank you for all the volunteers uh, from the different uh, schools and universities, uh, but also people who have volunteered from within ITU, uh, even though you know they no longer work for me type directly, but it's their passion uh, that has led them to help me with this. So thank you very much all, and thank you all for being here this morning. Now I shall give the mic to Ahmed Rashid, uh, our celebrated journalist, to, in to introduce the speaker. Thank you. I, I, I don't think there are many people in this room who don't know Mark Lyle Brown. Um, he has uh, been in Pakistan for a long period of time as a junior diplomat and then as High Commissioner uh, in 2003. And after that, he was um, at the British representative at the United Nations um, and uh, more, uh, even more arrows to his bow, of course, being appointed uh, National Security Advisor to two Prime Ministers, <laughs> David Cameron and um, uh, Theresa. We have a very strong link with uh, uh, Mark. Simply, his family has been in the Indian subcontinent forever. Um, his uh, ancestor, his, uh, Fes, our, our own city of Faisalabad, or Lyalpur, as it was called when I was young, um, is named after the, the, the Lyalgrand family. 
So we are very proud to have uh, uh, brought him back to Pakistan. He's going to be giving a, a talk on, on the nation state and the problems of governance. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be a very well. I, I'm going to stand back, let him speak for about 20 minutes, and I'll engage him with some questions. And hopefully, we have time for questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, may I introduce Mark, Sir Mark Lazaro? Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Emmett, and uh, Yakub also for inviting me to attend this Lahore Think Fest. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in the country where I spent uh, seven years of my professional life and have such pleasant memories. And it's a real joy to see so many old friends and uh, hopefully new friends in the audience uh, today. I feel very much at home here. But so does my father, who uh, first arrived in Rawalpindi in 1938. And he's 104 now, but still in very sound mind. And I went to see him at the weekend before coming out to Pakistan. And he said, uh, he said, Mark, I'm very worried about the state of the world. Because he'd been reading the news from the Gulf. And I wanted to cheer him up, so I said, Listen, Dad, you were born in 1915, one year into the Great War. You fought in Burma throughout the Second World War. You went to Hiroshima four months after the first atom bomb was dropped. You survived the whole of the Cold War. Surely, compared to what you've seen in your life, 2020 is not that bad. But he was not convinced. And actually, he's not completely wrong. Because despite the very many strategic advances that we've seen in recent years, and we certainly shouldn't forget that, the fact that there are fewer conflict deaths today than there has been for the last 200 years, the fact that life expectancy is increasing all over the world, that 800 million people have been taken out of poverty in the last 30 years. But that for the first time last year, more money has been invested in renewables than in fossil fuels. These are all very important strategic answers. But despite that, there's no doubt that across the world, we are seeing a range of major threats and challenges such as the big power rivalry, conflict, instability, terrorism, cyber and technology, climate change. And the current tensions between the United States and Iran is just one example of many that I could cite. But the point I want to make today is that in my view, despite all these threats and challenges, the biggest strategic threat that the world faces today is the erosion of the rules-based international order. Because a majority of independent sovereign states have a population of less than 10 million people. And they, even more than large and medium-sized countries like Pakistan and the United Kingdom, rely on being able to operate and trade internationally. And that, in turn, requires an effective rules-based order. And that order is today under severe threat. And that has consequences not only for our prosperity, but also for our collective ability to tackle longer-term security threats, such as climate change, health pandemics, migration pressures, drugs, and other serious organized crime. And it's worth just recalling that when the winners, the victors of World War II, set up the new organizations and norms in the, 19, in the 1940s and 50s, such as the United Nations, the GATT, which became the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, and later the Non-Proliferation Treaty, they did so
We can turn this off if you like. I can have this thing up. <laughs> can people hear me? Yes. 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 So, when, when these the winners of the Second World War set up these new norms and organizations, they did so in their own image. And it was therefore a liberal vision based on open trade, the rule of law, and human rights. Now, some have argued that these are artificial Western values. But I would argue that they are human values and therefore universal human values. Okay. And it was on the back of these new institutions that regulatory regimes and standards were established on everything from conflict to the environment, from trade to aviation and shipping. Basically all international interactions were founded in this era. Now, the end of the Cold War in 1989 ushered in a 25-year golden period for this liberal international order, during which we saw a flourishing of new institutions and new <coughs> initiatives, such as the International Criminal Court, the Human Rights Council, a rapid expansion in UN peacekeeping missions across <coughs> the world. There were new concepts developed, such as humanitarian intervention, responsibility to protect, women's rights, LGBT rights were advanced. And what is striking is that every single one of these new initiatives were put forward by the West, and every single one went in a liberal, rights-based direction. But since about 2012, we have seen a more systematic pushback against this liberal international order. Now, why is that? The sharp point of the spear of this pushback was actually LGBT rights. But that then moved into women's rights and into civil and political rights. And the extent of the pushback was brought home to me when I was ambassador at the United Nations in 2015. And in 2015, we wanted to celebrate the 20th anniversary of something called the Beijing Platform of Action. And this was a base document of women's rights that was agreed by consensus in Beijing in 1995. Nothing very dramatic, but it was an agreed document. And it was clear that in 2015, not only were we unable to celebrate as we would have liked the 20th anniversary of that document, but that it would not have been possible to agree that document that had been agreed 20 years earlier in China by consensus. And that was the extent of the pushback against this liberal order by that time. Now, why has that happened? I think there's obviously a number of different reasons, but I would highlight three. The first was the military interventions in Iraq in 2005, in Libya in 2011. Undoubtedly played a part, because some nations felt that the West had exploited concepts such as humanitarian intervention and responsibility to protect, to encroach upon sovereignty and to impose unrealistic Western democratic norms on developing countries and even promote <coughs> regime change. There was the financial crisis of 2008, which undermined the faith in capitalism and the competence of Western leaders to manage the effects of globalization. And more fundamentally still, geopolitics were changing, particularly, of course, with the rise of China. <coughs> now, China's extraordinary economic rise has increased its right and its ability to set the international agenda. But particularly for those in the West, there is a big question mark about China's intentions. In Davos three years ago, President Xi suggested that China might move into the space vacated by the United States, 
particularly on climate change and trade. But since then, he has proposed something much more ambitious, calling for China to lead the reform of the global governance system with the concepts of fairness and justice. And if this means a new Made in China version of the world order and governance, it would certainly be based on a very different value system from that we've been used to since the Second World War. And it's against this background that I see some worrying trends in today's world. There are a number of blatant challenges to the international order. Russian annexation of Crimea and adventurism in Georgia and eastern Ukraine. China's militarization of the South China Sea. North Korea and Iran's nuclear ambitions. Assad's use of chemical weapons in Syria. Myanmar's genocide against the Rohingya. All these are blatant violations of the established international order. But we're also witnessing a rise in terrorism, in nationalism, and populism, including in North America and Europe, exacerbated in some cases by uncontrolled migration. And there is a swing towards greater authoritarianism right across the world. Obvious examples include Egypt, Thailand, Turkey, the Philippines, Tanzania, even Brazil, Hungary. So last year, for instance, the Economist International Intelligence Unit suggested that 89 countries were going backwards on the spectrum of democracy, and only 27 were going forward. And significantly, at this critical time, the liberal order's traditional champion, the President of the United States, doesn't himself believe in it. Last September, in his speech at the UN General Assembly, President Trump again, again railed against what he calls the ideology of globalization. And he has backed up that rhetoric with action. He has pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, the Iran Nuclear Deal, the INF Treaty, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And he has ignored international law by recognizing Israel's occupation of the Golan Heights and settlements in the West Bank. He's deprioritized human rights in dealings with countries like Saudi Arabia and North Korea. And he's undermining the World Trade Organization by blocking the appointment of judges and undermining free trade by using commercial tariffs for purely political purposes. Moreover, at a strategic level, just one, hello, just one, two. Is that a question? <laughs> at a strategic level, President Trump has made clear that he plans to challenge China on the military, economic, and technological fronts. And the last in particular is important because China has set itself the aim of becoming the dominant player in emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, genetic engineering, and other biotechnologies. And President Trump has said he will fight to maintain America's domination in these fields. Today we are only witnessing a few first exchanges of that US-China technological competition. <coughs> but it is already putting great pressure on the global economy. And it's also putting countries like the United Kingdom, like Pakistan, into the difficult position of being forced to choose between the two compute, um, competing superpowers. And we see in my country, for instance, the arguments over whether it's going to be possible to use Huawei in the 5G technological uh, revolution. So whatever violent upheavals we may see in the Middle East, ructions in Europe, adventurism from President Putin, 
we should be in no doubt that it is the US-China relationship which will dominate geopolitics over the next decade. So, the international order that has done so much to prevent a third world war, that has facilitated increased global prosperity and the alleviation of poverty, is now under serious threat, without any clarity about what will take its place. So far from the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama put it 30 years ago, we are entering a decade of unprecedented uncertainty in which the ultimate success of democracy on the one hand and economic liberalism on the other hand can no longer be taken for granted. So if we, and by we I don't just mean the West, but all those countries that have a vested interest in a rules-based international order, we need to come up with a credible plan in the short term for pushing back against the most egregious breaches that I've mentioned of the international order, whilst mitigating the current US administration's disruptive approach. But in the longer term, for finding a way to peacefully adapt the international governance structures which need to be changed to accommodate countries like China, like India, like Brazil, that are rising powers, without undermining the underlying order which has served us so well for the last 75 years. Now, interestingly, this crisis of the rules-based international order is happening at a time when the sovereign nation-state itself is under great and probably unprecedented strain. We have become used to thinking that governments are all powerful. But the current system of sovereign independent countries is less than 400 years old, going back to the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, which is a relatively short period of human history. Now, it is true that the number of countries in the world has increased very dramatically over the last 70, 80 years. There were about 70 countries in 1945. There were 193 sovereign countries. <coughs> but this is as much a sign of weakness of the nation state than its strength. <coughs> After all, all of the newest countries that have been created, like South Sudan, Montenegro, East Timor, by definition, are fragments, are breakaways of existing countries as are all the aspirant states that are waiting to become independent. Kosovo, Palestine, Bulgaria, all of these are breakaways from existing countries. So consider for a moment some of the pressures on today's nation state. There's pressures of regionalism. In every part of the world, countries are banding together in order to be able to tackle global issues together. Now, the most developed regional organization is the European Union. But that is being imitated in different ways in every region of the world, whether it's ASEAN or the African Union or Mercosur. Interestingly, South in the South Asia region is probably the weakest regional organization of all. But they are all moving in that direction. And that, by definition, takes some sovereignty away from the nation state. And indeed, that is at the heart of the Brexit debate in my own country, that loss of sovereignty to a supranational regional organization. But at the same time as that is happening, we're seeing massive pressure for localization where people want decisions to be taken at a lower level than the government. At an extreme, that leads to independence movements, whether in Quebec or Scotland or Catalonia. There are hundreds of independence movements around the world. 
But even when there isn't an active independence movement, there are huge tensions between a federal center and the constituent parts of the provinces or states. America is a good example of that. Pakistan is another example. I mean, did you know that in the United States, California has sued the federal government in Washington a hundred times in the last few years? That is a sign of the tension between the local and the federal level. And then, on one side, you have multinational corporations that operate globally, that are not bound by national borders. The biggest tech companies in the world are now some of the biggest, richest entities in the world. There are four private companies that come in the list of the top 20 entities now in the world. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Alphabet. And I'm not talking about Saudi Aramco and things which are government essentially own. And these corporations are not just richer, they also own more data than governments. And data is power in today's world. So they are becoming more powerful than governments. And that leads to all sorts of difficulties for a government. The British government is unable to tax Google on the profits it makes in the UK because it says it doesn't make any profits in the UK, it's incorporated in Dublin, and therefore they'll pay a completely separate tax rate in Dublin. This is just one example of how multinational corporations have made it a weaker power for national government. And then there's the internet and other technology. By definition, the internet, of course, does not respect any national borders. And governments that try to control the flow of information on the internet, countries like China, like Turkey, like India, find it extremely difficult to control that flow of information and often are reduced to switching the thing off completely, as we've seen recently in India. You know, I remember a time when governments were the first to know. Governments are never the first to learn now. Yeah, if we're sitting, I was national security advisor, if we're sitting in the, in the coat, what's called the Cobra room, which is the emergency room where you know, the Prime Minister will chair an emergency session because there's been a terrorist incident um, on the streets of London or whatever, we have Sky News up on the, on, the, on the side of the wall because actually you'll get more information about what's actually happening from social media or from the 24-hour the, uh, news channel than you will from the intelligence agencies sitting around the table. That is a shift of power from the governments to non-government. And then you have religion. You know, all religions, by definition, of course, are transnational and always have been. But we are seeing a greater assertiveness of religious identity over national identity in many parts of the world. Now, political Islam is often quoted as the classic case of this, but India's new citizenship law is a, an example of putting religious identity ahead of national identity. And then there's migration. We're in an age of mass migration as people flee conflict and persecution or simply search for a better life. And with population growth almost entirely in the global south, these pressures, migration pressures, can only uh, increase. And there are other pressures too that I could mention. The state's traditional monopoly of force and currency is being undermined. Cryptocurrencies are designed specifically to undermine the government's control of currency. You know, in many countries of the world, like Lebanon and Somalia, militias are stronger than the armed forces of the country. So what does all this mean, all these pressures? Sometimes I think of the nation state now as an egg. Now an egg is a structure, as you know, that if you put symmetrical pressure on an egg, it's actually an extremely strong structure. <coughs> but if you put asymmetrical pressure on an egg, it's very easy to work. And my concern is that some of these pressures are now becoming asymmetrical. Now you might ask, okay, if the nation state is coming towards the end of its natural term,
term, then what will replace it? Now that is the realm of speculation. In fiction, there are lots of examples. You have the world government idea of H.G. Wells and Star Trek. They talk about a world government. You have the competing blocks, three giant competing blocks of George Orwell's 1984, Oceania, Eurasia, East Asia. That's perhaps slightly more realistic. You've got the reduction to medieval states, um, sort of city-state systems that <coughs> continued in northern Italy for many years. Like or you have the post-apocalyptic breakdown into tribal ethnic groups. Now, none of these alternatives to the current international government structure looks very realistic today. But I put it to you that it would be unwise to think that over the next hundred years or so, that nothing will change within the current government structure that we have today. Thank you very much. Hello, is this working? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, that was brilliant, of course, needless to say. Um, let me start with, first of all, you know, this, this golden period. Uh, and certainly there was a golden period and a lot was achieved between the end of the Cold War and uh, the beginning of the new Cold War, if you like, and uh, the terrorist attacks in America, etc. Um, but, you know, uh, we can also blame the present crisis with China and Russia and all these big powers to that time because, in a sense, uh, the Russians felt that they were exploited uh, by the West, that uh, NATO moved into the former Russian, uh, the so former Soviet republics, and, and made them into the allies of NATO. Um, for example, I mean that was something that the, the Russians, I don't think, have ever. Putin certainly has never forgiven uh, the Americans uh, for doing that. Um, China was, in a sense, ignored or, or taken very lightly. Um, I think. The West not realizing that China was going to come up as a major power within, a, within the next 10, 15 years, and China needed to be brought on board as quickly as possible with the whole international um, thing. So the, 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 the point I'm trying to simply make is that um, I think a lot, of, a lot of them missed out on the golden period, uh, during the golden period. You know, I think that's, that's a fair analysis. I think, look, throughout the Cold War, the liberal international order did survive, did succeed. But of course, there was a lot of resistance, particularly from the Soviet Union. But they sort of stood outside the global system. They would prefer to do things bilaterally, start negotiations with the United States, but didn't seriously disrupt what was going on. But what happened was that when the Soviet Union collapsed, that opposition vanished. China had never opposed what was going on. They kept a very low profile at the United Nations in particular. So what happened was that then there was this flourishing. You're right, you can argue that there was overreach by the West. And there were some strategic decisions that were taken that were wrong, that allowed uh, a sentiment to build up, particularly in the post-Soviet Union, in Russia, that they were being exploited economically, but also geographically and strategically because of uh, the advance of NATO, etc. I would absolutely accept that, that the seeds of the pushback were in that golden period. I think the, I mentioned the uh, military interventions in Iraq and Libya, undoubtedly, they also led to a lot of opposition. But I would still argue that the initiatives that were done then, the widening of the UN peacekeeping operations, the focus on human rights, the focus on women's rights, the focus on LGBT rights, that it were worth pursuing. Whether we overstepped, we the West overstepped, I think that's a fair analysis and it certainly led to some of the some of the future. On, on, on the second part of you know the, the modern era, I mean what, what really concerns I think a lot of people, especially in our part of the world is, is the 
um, is the question of democracy. What, what you're seeing in Latin America, in uh, parts of Asia, in Africa, is that um, uh, autocrats, right-wing extreme, extremists, um, all sorts of odd, odd people are coming up into power on the back of a democratic election. Um, some, some of these elections are free and fair, and some of them are not. But the fact is that uh, democracy itself is now sprouting um, uh, extremist rulers who, who take a country from what's happening in, even in the West, in Hungary, for example. Um, you've got a very extreme regime um, in Austria, in Hungary, in, um, and then not to speak of the Middle East, where you've actually had elections in some of these countries which, are, uh, which have led to even more instability. Um, and uh, you've got um, uh, very strong-minded, uh, either, either people from the military or people from right-wing extremist parties becoming president and prime minister. How do we deal with this? Is this the end of democracy? How do we see, is the next generation going to not have any kind of democratic framework? Well, I was careful to define the liberal order as being based on the values of uh, the rule of law, uh, human rights and open trade. I specifically didn't mention democracy in that research. But equally, I don't think we can define democracy by elections. And this is one of the weaknesses, I think, of the uh, definition. You know, democracy is a whole panoply of the rule of law, institutions, the freedom of expression, freedom of religion, all those freedom of association, all those things make up democracy. And what we have found is that if you go too quickly to elections and say democracy is all about elections, then some very unpleasant people get elected. Let's not forget that Hitler was elected. I mean, he was an elected politician. So uh, elections do not necessarily bring about democracy. Uh, and I think it's really important to understand that. But so how do you define I'm just, democracy? I'm just going on my sort of 40 years experience as a, in sort of public service, and I think there is some truth in the, in the Winston Churchill dictum that, you know, democracy is the worst form of government apart from all the others. And, you know, we haven't seen viable alternatives. And I don't myself think that the sort of benign dictatorship approach, which some people have favored, works in the long term. It can work in the short term, to drive economic development, and you've seen it in small places like Singapore, it can work. But look at China, for instance. You know, China is trying to ride the twin tigers of economic liberalism and political repression. And I don't think that will be possible in the longer term. We saw a hint of problems back in 1989, but I would be surprised if there were not some form of clash at some point in China. Difficult to know exactly when it is. So it's very difficult to come up with a viable alternative to the democratic model, but recognizing that democracy is more than elections and there isn't any one single model of democracy. I mean, I'm struck by, for instance, in the European Union, there are 28 countries uh, at the moment, and every single one has a different electoral system. Every single of the 28 countries has a different system. So it's not about elections. It's about the wide underpinnings of democracy. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, the other issue is the militarization that has taken place by the big powers, especially uh, the United States. Um, if, if you looked at, you know, after the attack on New York, um, we all thought that the focus of the West would be um, rebuilding Afghanistan and stabilizing this region. Uh, but instead, I mean, you know, President Bush goes off into Iraq, and uh, there's very little protest from uh, the Europe. Oh, but there is some protest, but not meaningful protest from the Europeans and others. And I, I, I fear that we are repeating the same thing now with Iran. Um, we're, we're stumbling into, a, into a, a long conflict or possibly a war with Iran because uh, the Americans have suddenly decided that Iran is enemy number one for, for everything. This is very similar to what it thought of Iraq, um, you know, back in, uh, after 9-11. And um, 
how do, how do we get around explaining to uh, the Americans and, of course, to the Iranians as well, that the, the, the dangers inherent in, in this kind of politics? Well, there's a danger of me agreeing with you, Ahmed, which I'm always <laughs> loath to do, but, 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 you know, I agree with you on, uh, on this. I think it was a strategic mistake by President Trump to have pulled out of the nuclear deal. He basically did so because it was a deal done by Obama, not because there was anything inherently wrong with the deal. The American argument is that the nuclear deal dealt only with the nuclear problem and didn't deal with the ballistic missile problem or Iran's malign influence in the region. But the counter argument is that it didn't prevent the West or others pushing back against the ballistic missile program or the malign influence in the region. But at the same time, it did take off the table the Iran nuclear deal or the Iran nuclear threat. All that has happened now is that the nuclear has come back into the mix and we're faced with the problem of dealing with all three issues uh, that uh, Iran poses. So I think Iran, um, the United States is going about this the wrong way and a lot of the tensions that we're seeing today flow from that first decision by President Trump to pull out yeah. of the Iran nuclear deal. So I agree with you on that. Yeah. Aren't we also seeing the, the, the beginning of the end of diplomacy as, as a real a weapon of, of you know, peacemaking, issue solving, etc. I mean, where are the great diplomats now? Um, uh, compared even to the Cold War period, when you produced uh, some really uh, uh, very big figures who, who uh, nurtured all sorts of peace deals. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to say we're coming to the end of diplomacy. There will always be diplomacy. Yeah. It's the second oldest profession. <laughs> and uh, it will... <laughs> It will always, there will always be uh, diplomats and there will always be diplomacy. I think there's a, there is a, maybe a crisis of, of politics, um, and I think certainly I'm thinking of my own country now, that people are not, the best people are not being attracted into politics uh. because the downsides of politics, the exposure, the uh, abuse, um, the threat has become that much greater and the power that you can exert and things you can do have become reduced for some of the reasons I was saying. And so not necessarily the best people go into uh, politics. And I think that is a problem. Because if you want to change the world, you want to change your locality, you want to change your country, you know, politics is still the best way of doing it. Right. Uh, how long have we got? Is there time for... Hello? Is, is there time for a few questions from the audience? Nobody seems to know the answer to that. Um, well, Javed uh, Jabbar uh, here in the front. I irresistible force. Compliments are markedly used in the Bahrain reputation. I would urge you to reconsider the observation that the rules-based post-World War II order was in some ways an ideal order or a very positive order because from its very inception there was a duality and a hypocrisy. For example, America's intervention to remove the Mossadegh government in Iran was a violation of law, was a violation of rules. Sanctions imposed on Cuba, sanctions reimposed on Iran after 79 the disregard for the International Court of Justice, Nicaragua, for example, and then the perpetuation of this distinction of who can possess missiles and nuclear weapons, complete silence on Israel's nuclear capacity. So the rules-based order is nostalgia or mythology, and not really, it was selectively applied where certain dominant powers wanted rules to apply. And that is why it possibly will not be restored or be effective in the future. We need a much more participative, equitable system where everyone respects it. That is true. Absolutely true. And I accept everything you say. The problem is, the alternative is that you don't have any rules-based order at all. When the United Nations was set up, compromises were made. 
because its predecessor, the League of Nations, had failed. And the reason that it had failed was that the big powers were not prepared to give up any degree of sovereignty, any degree of their own independence in order to join it. And it didn't prevent the Second World War. So the compromise, as you rightly say, that was reached after the Second World War was that we will allow the big powers at the time to have the veto, to have an ability to join the organization without giving up all their possibilities of independent action. Now, that is not universally popular, but it was a necessary, I think, compromise at the time. And what is very striking is that still the United Nations is the only place in the world where all 193 countries get together, where everyone can talk to everyone else. And at least in some parts of it, in the General Assembly, it is one country, one vote. So China may have 1.5 billion people, and Tuvalu has 11,000 people, but they both have one vote. And that is very valuable. Now, if you were to say, well, the way to solve uh, say, American adventurism or what they're doing in the Middle East or what Russia is doing in Ukraine is to get rid of the veto, those countries would walk away from that structure and you would then just have chaos and anarchy. So the debate we're having at the moment is whether to induct new players into the sacred circle, if you like, like countries like India and Brazil and South Africa, now, is that a compromise worth making to bind them in, or does it just make it worse because it allows more players to have a freedom to do what they like? I know where the Pakistan government sits on that question. So you, it is a compromise, but it is still better than what went before, and it is still a mechanism that limits the amount of conflict and does allow you to resolve some conflict. So yes, it is flawed, but it's still better, I think, than the alternative. Right. Um, I have. Can I have a question? Yes, yeah, question. Yeah. The gentleman in. Okay. In the in the white sweater. Sir. Uh, Hello. Is it on? Okay. Uh, so my sir, question is. Uh, thank you very much to have on the floor with us. Uh, I'm representing the University of Lucky Marwat. Uh, my question is that in the name of liberalization, globalization, modernization, and so-called digitalization, MNCs across the world are using the data of individuals and states, and it may raise many eyebrows toward the sovereignty of nation as well as individuals. So how we can tackle the problem of our sovereignty in the world of digital world? May I question? Should yes. We, should we take one more? Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Najam, sir, my Najam, question Najam, is. Najam has a question. Sir, my question is. I can't deny. Uh, sir, the don't you think so? No. Sir, don't you think so? That it that it is small failure of the liberal democracy system have given rise to the extremist ideologies based on religion. The classic example is Daesh, so which is setting the world order. So what strategy do you envision? in order to tackle these extremist ideologies and ensure peace and order in the world at large. Let, let me just ask Najam to ask his question and then we'll put them all together. Thank you. Um, Mark, very illuminating talk, and I think the questions that have been raised from the audience also require some answers. But I'd like you to, as much as possible, move away from the international order and come to Pakistan for a bit. Um, I gather that you had a, uh, an interesting role to play in the transition from Musharraf's rule to democracy. It would be interesting for all of us to know exactly what sort of uh, negotiations took place and <laughs> why the international community, in particular yourself and people like yourself, thought that there was a particular way of moving the system forward. It would be nice to know something about the role that you played and some others played. Okay, uh, the, I'll ask the, answer the digital question and, and, and just touch on that. Um, I might leave... Um, 
Emma to talk about the extremism <laughs> point. He knows a lot more about that than, than I do, perhaps. Um, on the digital, what is fascinating is that there is a big struggle between governments now and the big tech companies. For the reasons I say, the tech companies now have more data on individuals than governments on the whole. And that data has been volunteered by individuals to the companies. Not always knowingly, but it's been volunteered. Every time you log in, you are giving information away. And that is more than the government. The government asks for information, which you have to give it, but it's a much more limited kind. So actually, I see the balance of power on data having shifted from governments to these big tech companies. And that's why you're permanently finding governments trying to ask the tech companies to decrypt their information, for instance, to release information that the government wants for maybe counter-terrorism operations or whatever. Uh, and the t tech companies are saying, no, no, privacy prevents us from doing that. We have to protect our clients. But they are using that data themselves for their own commercial gain. Now, I think we are moving slowly towards a period where people own their data, that they recognize there is value for their data, and that therefore they don't give away any data without getting something in return. And therefore, individuals will start monetizing their own information. And that will be, I think, the big revolution coming uh, on, on that side. Now, Jim, look, I don't think this is the right forum to go into details. It is true that I did play a role. Um, for a while, I acted as a go-between between, between President Basharraf and, and Benazir Bhutto in particular. Um, at a time when the People's Party was the most popular party in, in Pakistan, to ensure that if there were to be a return to democracy, which the British government and many other governments were pushing for, that it would be a valid exercise that could be recognized internationally. It was a small role, it was a humble role, but I played that role that did break the logjam that led eventually to uh, at the elections being held and Benazir coming back, unfortunately, obviously with tragic uh, consequences, it turned out. But that was just one of the goals, if you like, of the British government, which was to encourage a return to democracy in Pakistan. And that will always be the goal. We have always favored democracy over other forms of, of government, and we've encouraged uh, in any way we can Pakistan to move in that direction. It was just at a particular time where I did play a particularly personal role uh, for several months in that area. I can talk to you privately. You know more than, and, than you're saying anyway, but uh, I'm happy to talk privately to people, but obviously some things are not in the public domain. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yes. I'm very sorry for the constraint of time. This would be the last question. We have to start the next session, so sorry. Right, one more question, right? Yes, one last question. Okay, this gentleman in the white sweater here, which I've been... I have the mic. Just, just. <laughs> Emma, I have the mic. Okay. okay, so I will ask my question. Uh, I have a follow up question on the question of technology. And uh, Your Excellency, you highlighted many challenges being faced by the nation state, like regionalism, localism, and other. So uh, there are two models, and the one model that is emerging. That is, uh, the Western model was in a way that led to directly uh, or indirectly to the erosion of government power, whether it was uh, civil rights, too much focus, and the alternative model being offered by China along all the way through the built and road countries. That is increasing focus on uh, building and um, enhancing state capacity. And the technological question too is, wouldn't it be more preferable to have the control of data in government hands, like it is in China, as opposed to uh, data control in the hands of multinational corporations and big tech giants? Thank you. I'm not sure either is wholly desirable, to be honest, um, but I do 
con would be concerned about the, the China model, if you like. I mean, just to take the example that is in the news at the moment, which is the facial recognition technology, which is extremely developed in China. Now, you could say that it is not unreasonable for the government to be allowed to know where everybody is at any one time and what they're doing. Personally, that's not a model that I would favor living in. I think a certain degree of privacy and privacy of action is still required. And the advantage of at least the data being uh, given to the technology companies, it is voluntarily being given. You don't have to log on to any internet if you don't want to. You know, you can, don't have to be on Facebook, you don't have to be on WhatsApp, you don't have to be on these uh, platforms. So at least you have that option. In China, you don't have that option. Your face is on the, the, uh, the system and you can be tracked anywhere in the world by that system. I'm not sure that that is a better model myself and I wouldn't like to see uh, myself living in a country that, uh, that went in that direction, to be honest. Ambassador well, Grant. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Emma, there's one question here. I think they did say one. Uh, well, you haven't been looking at this side of the audience. Okay, this would be the last question yeah. of this session, please. Ambassador Grant, you gave a wonderful analysis of the breakdown of the international order. But I'd like you to ponder on one thing that the more powerful a country, the greater the responsibility it bears for this. Now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was enormous hubris in the West, in particular with uh, the plan for the new American century. Then in Britain, the notion that we could once again rule the world. And so, in 2003, on fabricated charges, Iraq was invaded, and that has then led to the entire, to the breakdown of the order in the Middle East. It wasn't a good order to begin with, but now we've seen the ruins of that, not just in Iraq, but in Syria and in Libya. So Britain under Tony Blair and the United States under George W. Bush, I think, bear the lion's share for the breakdown of the international order. Yeah, as a, I think that's putting it a bit too strongly, but uh, I did say that one of the three factors that I cited for the pushback against the order was the interventions in Iraq uh, and Libya. And of course, in retrospect, mistakes were made. I can only speak for the British government, I can't speak for the American government, but in the British government, there was a genuine belief that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, and that underpinned the decision to go ahead with the United States. That intelligence proved to be wrong, but it was actually a genuine uh, belief. Now, it had the consequences that you've mentioned, I don't disagree with that. But my point is that if you don't have a rules-based order at all, you have no constraints on actions. At least with the current order as it is, there are some constraints. Before that, there were none. If you look at the 19th century, there were none. Might was right. So Britain could, yes, go and take colonies, it go anywhere in the world and exploit trade, exploit the individuals or whatever. All that, there was absolutely no uh, restraint on that activity. Now at least there is some constraint. It's abused from time to time by the big powers. There's no question about that. And that has got to be tackled, as I mentioned. But the idea that you just sweep away the current system and replace it with, with what? I think is very dangerous, and we'll just see more of the sorts of mistakes made that you're talking about. Well, thank you very much. Can we give okay. a very strong hand to Mark? <laughs>